you thought the Supreme Court was done ruining American life? Well, I've got news for you. They're back. And now they're coming for the Voting Rights Act. Hey, friends, Abdul Al Sayed here. Today, we're talking about how the Supreme Court could be coming for the Voting Rights Act. But first, make sure to like, subscribe, tell your friends. Word of mouth really does go a long way. At issue in this case, which the Supreme Court just heard earlier this week, is the question of the way that congressional maps were drawn in the state of Alabama. Now, the Voting Rights Act exists to make sure that black folks have equal access to the ballot. And don't forget, this wasn't about all states. This was about former Confederate states where Jim Crow was live when the Voting Rights Act was passed. And in states like Alabama, they used to use things like literacy tests to make sure that black folks simply couldn't vote. The Voting Rights Act was intended to address that. But the other way that you can dilute the votes of black folks is to draw maps that either pack them all together in one place or crack them apart across a bunch of other places so that, well, you don't have equal representation. And that's exactly what a lower court judge said that Alabama basically did. Because 27% of Alabamians, Alabamans, people from Alabama, are black. Out of the seven congressional districts that were recently drawn, only one of them is majority black. So the only way to do that is if you're packing and cracking. You're gerrymandering specifically around race. And that's the issue that the Supreme Court is hearing a case on right now. And guess what? The Supreme Court is 6-3 conservative. They are very likely to leverage this case to try and strike down either all of or part of the Voting Rights Act. Some context. This isn't the first time the Supreme Court has come for the Voting Rights Act. The last time it did was 2013, when the Supreme Court struck down another critical section of the Voting Rights Act under one Chief Justice John Roberts. In that case, the question was about preclearance. The question of whether or not a state with a significant history of past discrimination against black voters had to pre-clear any changes to their voting system with the federal government. And that gets kind of technical, but it involves Section 4B and Section 5. Section 4B, which was ultimately struck down, which is critical to being able to enforce pre-clearance, that section basically creates a formula around which pre-clearance is required. That includes things like the pre-existence of poll testing back when the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 and the outcomes of that, meaning that a substantial proportion of the population was not registered to vote. And so if you're discriminating people at the polls and they're not voting for it, that's the whole point of the Voting Rights Act. But the Supreme Court struck that down in the kind of circular logic that we've gotten pretty used to around these parts, which is basically that, well, because the Voting Rights Act has addressed in part some of the discrimination that existed, there's no longer discrimination and the Voting Rights Act is not important. It's like putting your hand on a leak and then saying that the leak is done so you should take your hand off. But this case is about section two. Section two is about outlawing procedures or practices that would discriminate on race. And well, if you draw congressional maps that are all about packing or cracking a population because of their race, such that they are underrepresented in the congressional districts that you draw, you might think that that was a violation of the Voting Rights Act. At least that's what lower court judges have said. But the Supreme Court has agreed to see this case. And the argument that the state of Alabama has made is that if they were to redraw districts specifically so that there was more representation, meaning there was another district that represented a majority black district, well, they would be explicitly using race to draw those boundaries. And because the Voting Rights Act stipulates that race can't be the only reason why you draw a boundary, they're arguing that, well, it'd be reverse discrimination. And, well, claims of reverse discrimination tend to fail on the fact that it assumes that every group has the same amount of power. But if you're a black person in the minority in Alabama, where you or your family was subject to Jim Crow, and then before that, slavery, it's hard to argue that there's not a clear, deep, profound power imbalance operating when it comes to voting rights in Alabama. But here's the scariest part. Almost anybody who watches the Supreme Court will tell you that this is not going to end well for voting rights. There's a 6-3 conservative majority, and under John Roberts, this court has been particularly dubious of any claims of racial discrimination. Their whole goal is to pretend that racism no longer exists in America, and that's how they've ruled, particularly when it comes to the Voting Rights Act. And, well, that's a dangerous thing. It could be that they use this case to strike down the entire Voting Rights Act. And therefore, we go back to a time when it was legal 
for states to openly discriminate through things like poll tests, literacy tests, whatever, asking you how many jelly beans are in a jar. Or they could just rule on part of the Voting Rights Act like they did in 2013, striking down maybe Section 2, which again makes it illegal to engage in practices that discriminate on the basis of race. And it's that Section 2 that assures that black folks are not packed and cracked into districts to dilute their power in a given state. Obviously, striking down the Voting Rights Act would be a devastating blow to racial equity and representation in this country. But really, any damage to the Voting Rights Act could take us many steps back in terms of those same questions. And the point here is that if you're not well represented in government, it's almost impossible for government to truly take into account your experience as it makes laws. And the notion that we're anywhere near equity or representation in American government, well, just take a look at Congress. Congress doesn't look like America. There is far less representation of people of color, black folks, than you would expect considering how many of us there are in this country. It's not that we need less of the Voting Rights Act, because frankly, the Voting Rights Act wasn't even enough to guarantee the kind of representation that people deserve in this country. And we talk a lot about empathy. And I think what empathy looks like in government is representation. It's the notion that there are people who look like you, share similar experiences to you making decisions about you and your life up there in government. And when your power is either eliminated because people are openly discriminating against you at the polls, or you're being packed and cracked into districts so that there aren't enough of you to actually claim power, well, you can understand why it is that government doesn't look like the people it's governing. And that, that should be a concern for all of us. Hey friend, thank you for watching. If you want to see more videos like this and have more of your questions answered, click the subscribe button on this screen. And if you want to support me and want more content, I hope that you'll subscribe to The Incision, my newsletter. There, I reflect a bit further, go a bit deeper on some of these issues, and I interview some of the leading thinkers of this moment. The link to subscribe is on the screen here. See you soon.